if you're part of the community where you're nourished and sustained by his presence, we rejoice with you. But if you're not, we invite you to join with us as we seek to grow in Christ, the love he offers, and our identity as a people blessed to be a blessing so that we can share that love with others. And I don't need to do much more than just point to the bulletin this morning. It's packed full of opportunities for that. We're continuing to collect for uh, Western North Carolina, and I would imagine before too long, Florida will be added to that list for those who have struggled and lost some things in the storms. Uh, but I also want to point out to you again, uh, Youth Quake this coming Saturday for our children in grades three through six. I see lots of you here this morning, so yeah, make note of that. Uh, Fall Festival, October 26th. Uh, and would like to say thanks to the cleanup guys yesterday. I was going to say, I uh, know there's a lot of work done, and right here where the mailboxes is, that looks wonderful. I mean, I don't know who rearranged that, but, but thank you. It's, it's got a nice feel to it. Uh, we also are going to have a couple of things coming up here in the future weeks to, uh, to bring up at a later time. But I would let you know, because I know that I, have, I haven't talked with them, but I know you guys are thinking, how much longer is this guy going to be here? What's going on with the call committee? I don't know what's going on with the call committee, but I can tell you for sure, well, I mean, exactly what's going on, but I can tell you for sure what's going on. They have received names from the Senate that they have then been, I hate to use the word vetting because it sounds too professional, but, but they have been reviewing, uh, they have then scheduled conversations with those folks, and as they com do those conversations, as they find a pastor or pastors they want to move forward with, they move into deeper and deeper conversations. And when they've found that one, that they say, this is the pastor for us, they will then present that person to the council, and you'll be told immediately because you'll then get an opportunity to meet them before a call. So just, just be patient um, and um, just enjoy the life that we have as we move along because, you know, I want to think it was uh, John Lennon was the one who said that life is what happens while we're making other plans. Uh, and enjoy the life that we have, but continue to pray for the call committee and for our future pastor that God will continue to guide our life. Any other questions uh, or announcements needed this morning? If not, let's take just a few moments to prepare our hearts for worship.
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin and come to God for healing. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we've honored you with our lips, but have harmed our neighbors with our tongues. The cravings at war within us cause conflicts and disputes. In our desire to be first, we make distinctions among ourselves. We place the needs of the poor and the suffering last. In your great mercy, forgive us our sins. Draw near to us with grace in time of need and turn us to follow in the way of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God promises to forgive our iniquity and to remember our sin no more. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, the source of eternal healing, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Please remain standing for our opening hymn. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, increase in us your gift of faith, that forsaking what lies behind and reaching out to what lies ahead, we may follow the way of your commandments and receive the crown of everlasting joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. The first reading comes from Amos chapter 5, verses 6 through 7, 10 through 15. Seek the Lord and live, or he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire, and it will devour Bethel with no one to quench it. Ah, you that turn justice to wormwood and bring right righteousness to the ground. They hate the one who reproves in the gate, and they harbor the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from them levies of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone. 
but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and push aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, the prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you. Just as you have said, hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading comes from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 to 16. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him, no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to the man, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. The man said to Jesus, teacher, I've kept all of these since my youth. Jesus, looking at the man, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the man heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Then they were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to Jesus, Look, we've left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. 
praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. A couple of weeks ago, I went to visit someone at a senior care facility, and just as I got to his door, an attendant closed it and told me it was bath time and that this was going to take a little while, but I could wait if I wanted to. So I kind of leaned against the wall outside the door and took a breath and decided to relax. And suddenly I became aware of voices up and down the hall desperately calling out for help. Voices that had been there all along, but I'd been too focused, too preoccupied to hear. Well, finally, an attendant entered the room right across from me and asked one of these gentlemen who was pleading for help, what do you need? Only to have the man respond, I don't know. I'm afraid the man's response articulates the frustrations of many of us these days. And I can't help but think that the man who approaches Jesus in today's gospel is wrestling with the same frustrations. You see, Jesus is on a journey to Jerusalem, where, as he's already told his disciples two times, he will suffer, be rejected, killed, and after three days rise again. And along the road, as he makes his way to Jerusalem, Jesus is teaching his disciples what it means that he is the Messiah and what it will mean to be part of his kingdom and to take up his cross and, and follow him. In recent weeks, Jesus has defined greatness not in terms of power or wealth or in being served, but in serving others, particularly the vulnerable. Jesus has also described abundant life not in terms of what the law allows, but rather in living what's possible in him, cherishing relationships, cherishing God's gift of marriage, understanding that all people have value and are precious to God. As we've heard, Jesus' words have cut the disciples to the quick. It's so contrary to their expectations and hopes of life with Jesus that they're clueless. But today the lesson continues as a man runs up, kneels at Jesus' feet, and asks what he must do to inherit eternal life. On the surface, this doesn't look like much of a big deal, but every other time someone kneels before Jesus in Mark's gospel, they are seeking healing, either for themselves or someone else. And this man would seem to be living the dream. Mark describes him as having many possessions. The, the man no doubt lives in a beautiful home, provides a comfortable life for his family, faithfully attends worship, makes the appropriate sacrifices, in fact probably does more than the necessary sacrifices, has kept the law since his youth. And like most people, including Jesus' disciples, he sees his life and his wealth as a reward from God for his faithfulness to God. And yet, the very act of his kneeling at the feet of Jesus and his question about eternal life suggests that something is missing, that the man senses that he still needs something or he needs to do something, and he's not sure what. But he believes that Jesus knows and can help him. We aren't given any reason to doubt the man's sincerity. Jesus doesn't rebuke him, doesn't discipline him, doesn't question his integrity. Instead, we're told that out of his love for the man, Jesus offers him the healing and wholeness that he seeks using five imperatives. This is go, sell, give, and then come and follow. Given the relational aspect of the commands that Jesus mentions and the inclusion of the command not to defraud, which in their social structure was to keep something that had been given you by someone else for safekeeping, Jesus' command to sell everything and give his money to the poor suggests 
that the man's wealth and possessions are keeping him, preventing him from being about the work of God's kingdom. So Jesus calls the man to dump his baggage and his expectations and to return to life with God, abundant life on God's terms. And Amos is doing exactly the same thing in the first lesson. In a very affluent and peaceful time in a northern kingdom, life is good. They are Israel strong. The kings, the priests, the people see their wealth and their blessings as a reward from God for their hard work and holiness and an affirmation of their faithfulness to God. But it's not. There's nothing evil about nice homes and vineyards, but we're told that they've been acquired by cheating one another, and selling justice to the highest bidder and taking advantage of those who are down on their luck, trampling and pushing to the side the very ones that they're called to serve, the poor, the widow, the orphan. The people worship regularly. They offer the required sacrifices, but they seek life in things rather than God. And their lack of actions and love towards others is separating them not only from others, but from God. So God, through Amos, offers to free the people from their false security of the baggage that weighs them down by calling them back to life with God on God's terms, terms of justice and righteousness, terms that pierce the very essence of their lives terms they will reject as ridiculous and impossible. Like the people to whom Amos speaks, the rich man cannot believe his ears. Jesus' words pierce him to his very soul, revealing the intentions of his heart. Because, because Jesus doesn't ask for one thing. It's going to cost him everything he values to follow Jesus. And how can he possibly do that? I mean, things are really good right now, but, but what if there's a bad storm? What if he gets hurt and can't work? Does, does Jesus offer an Aflac plan of some sort? What if he's offered a little more time? What if he were to say that he'd do some committee work at the synagogue or, or volunteer a couple of hours a month to feed the poor? Surely that would be enough, wouldn't it? While the man's piety and his wealth and his actions have not satisfied his longing for life with God, he still holds fast to them. He rejects the life that Jesus offers. The cost seems just too, too great. And as he walks away grieving, Jesus nudges his disciples toward a truth that calls into question where they look and how they measure abundant life. The reality that even if the man had sold everything and given the money to the poor, it still wouldn't have been enough. It's impossible for anyone to do enough to inherit eternal life. Life in God's kingdom is a gift from a God for whom all things are possible. And that's important to remember because as a still clueless Peter asks what their reward is going to be for following Jesus, Jesus describes a life of abundance with persecutions that will only be possible in God. And the same is true for us. While Jesus may not call us to sell everything we have and give the money to the poor, Following Jesus still means giving him our entire lives. And in a culture promising happiness and possessions and comfort and being bigger and successful, you don't have to be rich to know how easy, even financially prudent, it is to be cautious and fearful and to hold on to what we've got in hopes of securing our future. 
But that's never been the life that Jesus calls us to. Jesus didn't take on flesh and come among us to make us prosperous or successful or happy. He came to save us. He came to suffer and die. He came that through his faithfulness we may have, we may have eternal life in the age to come, an abundant life now in this age, an abundance that has nothing to do with what we own or how much we consume, and everything to do with following Jesus and being about his work, embodying his presence and forgiveness in a world crying out for help and yet doesn't know what they need, feeding the hungry, a life of caring for the poor and the weak, of helping those who have lost everything, and helping those who think they have everything. And yet sense that something's missing, something that, that possessions and education and ambition and even religion can't satisfy. Something that's only possible in God. Sisters and brothers in Christ, whatever it is we, we think we lack that prevents us from following Jesus and enjoying abundant life now on God's terms, the good news that brings us here and unites us and makes us one is that Jesus, the only help we need, is present, piercing our hearts with a living and active word, teaching us, molding us, comforting us, convicting us, loving us, and with his very body and blood and bread and wine, forgiving our sins, strengthening our faith, and freeing us from the baggage that weighs us down so that we may follow Jesus and share with others a love and a life and a help that we know and that we know is only possible for God and in God. What do we need? We need Jesus. And for his faithfulness, we say thanks be to God and amen. If you would now, please rise for the hymn of the day.
God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ. Living together in trust and hope, we profess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today's responses hear our prayer. Challenged by God's word in Christ, let us pray for the church, the world, and the whole creation. Compassionate God, embolden the church to seek all who are lost, clothe those who are naked, and mend what is broken. May we be generous bearers of your internal love, God of grace. Hear our prayer. Sustaining God, as we approach harvest time, we pray for farmers, field workers, and those who process crops. Keep us mindful of environmental threats to the nourishing food that feeds the world. God of grace. Steadfast God, inspire world leaders to share resources and work collectively to end global poverty, starvation, and preventable disease. Direct us to seek justice and equity that all may live in peace. God of grace. Loving God, we pray for those who are afflicted, tormented, grieving, oppressed, and lonely, especially those whom we now name before you with our lips and in the silence of our hearts. Deliver the strength of your love and compassion to all who need it today. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for all call committee and for all churches seeking pastors. Give us a holy patience in this time of seeking and waiting that we may trust in you for our present care, knowing that you will bring the faithful work of our call committee to fulfillment in your time. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Ever living God, we rejoice to be heirs of the eternal life made real in Jesus' death and resurrection. We give thanks for saints of all times and places, first and last, who still inspire us to faithful living. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share Christ's peace with one another.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, source of every gift of your creation. By these gifts, with our lives, help us to serve one another in all in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Today, as the usher shows you forward, you're going to receive a wafer, which you'll then dip into the chalice. There are gluten-free wafers for those who cannot partake of wheat, and the smaller of the two chalices has grape juice for those who cannot partake of wine. This is Christ's presence, Christ's hospitality that we offer. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
please stand as you're able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, you have welcomed us to this meal and fed us with dignity at your table. Send us now to welcome others and to be at peace with one another. Through Jesus our Lord. Amen. God Almighty, God most merciful, bless you, keep you, and give you his peace. Amen. Please remain standing for the sending hymn. Now go in peace, follow Jesus. <laughs>